Thank you very much and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packer. Welcome to Threshold of Hope, where we take a look at the writings of the church. And we are continuing on with the encyclical called Ut Unum Sint, which means that they may be one. 1995 encyclical by Pope St. John Paul II, dealing with the church's commitment to ecumenism. And you can download a free electronic copy of Ut Unum Sint by going to our website, ewtn.com. See the tab for the document library, tap that in, and you can get that along with tens of thousands of other documents that are all there for you to, to peruse through and put into your computer for free. Now, of course, we love to have you involved and participate in our show. Uh, come here to Sweet Home, Alabama and be in our studios in Irondale, Alabama, next door to Birmingham. Or you can send us your question by email, writing to threshold at EWTN.com. Or if you wish, you can call during our live broadcast, which is Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And the phone number is 1-800-221-221. 9460. That's if you're in North America. 1 800 221 9460. Or outside North America, you can call 1 205 271 2980. We are now beginning in this encyclical, uh, paragraph 86. This is a section that is fairly long. It's entitled, The Contribution of the Catholic Church to the Quest for Christian Unity. He begins by taking a look back at Vatican II and how the Constitution on the Church, Lumen Gentium, uh, gives a very basic uh, uh, assertion that is repeated in the document on ecumenism, which is called Unitatis Redintegratio. In paragraph 4 of Unitatis Redintegratio, we see, we believe that this unity of the church subsists in the Catholic Church as something she can never lose, and we hope that it will continue to increase until the end of time. And then we also see this same idea uh, in uh, uh, Lumen Gentium, I believe it's paragraph um, 8, paragraph 8, uh, where it says uh, in Lumen Gentium, which is the constitution of the church, where it says, this is the one church of Christ, which in the creed is professed as one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic, which our Savior after his resurrection commissioned Peter to shepherd, and him and the other apostles to extend and direct with authority, which he erected for all ages as the pillar and mainstay of the truth. It's a quote from uh, 1 Timothy 3. This church constituted and organized in the world as a society subsists in the Catholic Church, which is governed by the successor of Peter and by the bishops in union with him communion with him, although many elements of sanctification and of truth are found outside of its visible structure. These elements, as gifts belonging to the Church of Christ, are forces impelling toward Catholic unity. So this is very much one of the th points that uh, we see made at the Vatican Council, and that the, there's this emphasis on the fullness of in Latin plenitudo, of the means of salvation in the Catholic Church. We see, for instance, in the document on ecumenism, Unitatis Redintegratio, where it says, the separated churches and communities as such, do we believe them to be deficient in some respects, have been by no means deprived of significance and importance in the mystery of salvation for the Spirit of Christ has not refrained from using them as means of salvation, 
which derive their efficacy from the very fullness of grace and truth entrusted to the church. And so this is a, a very important element. As a matter of fact, I, I just went over to a vitamin store yesterday. You know, how, you know that doctors want to make sure that I get my vitamins and such. And the man, at, the man who runs the GNC store in, in a nearby town called Trustful um, met me there and you know, he uh, was a convert to, to Catholicism. And as such, he uh, says that, you know, because I asked him, do you look back on the church you used to belong to and consider it the uh, whore of Babylon or something? He said, no. I said, good, because we don't want converts to Catholicism to look back on the churches from which they came as something bad. They weren't bad. He's, but what he did say is, what I look at it, I said, wow, I, I was missing elements that I found in the Catholic Church. And that this was the, the great gift. So that it's not that he rejects any of the good that he grew up with in his denomination, but rather he appreciates this fullness that we're talking about. We see further in the document, Unitatis Rit Integratio, paragraph 3. Nevertheless, our separated brethren, whether considered as individuals or as communities and churches, are not blessed with that unity which Jesus Christ wished to bestow on all those who through him were born again into one body and with him quickened to newness of life. That unity which the Holy Scriptures and the ancient tradition of the Church proclaim. For it is only through Christ's Catholic Church, which is the, quote, all-embracing means of salvation, that they can benefit fully from the means of salvation. Remember, it's our Lord who said in Matthew 16, when speaking to Peter, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. He uses the word singular. And later on in chapter 18, when he mentions the church, he also uses the singular Christ intended for the church to remain unified. And this is what we profess. So this is something where we believe that there will be full unity among Christians. There's partial unity already and a sharing in the graces of God by all other Christians in varying degrees. But full unity will come about when everyone shares in the same uh, fullness of the means of salvation entrusted by Jesus Christ to his church. These means of salvation include scripture that was passed on you know, to the apostles who wrote it down. They wrote down the words of Christ and that was passed on by them to the bishops that they ordained after them and passed on down to us to this day. The bishops were the caretakers of that word of God through persecution and all sorts of other difficulties. And we also see the means of salvation with the sacraments that was passed on, baptism, the Holy Eucharist, confirmation, chrismation, that these gifts were passed on and ordination to the priesthood, that direct line that goes back. This is passed on. And this is what we talk about in terms of the fullness. And so this is something very important. Along the way that leads to full unity, ecumenical dialogue works to awaken a reciprocal fraternal assistance. What does he mean by that? Reciprocal fraternal assistance. Brothers or fraternal uh, uh, folks, brothers and sisters, who help each other, help each other back and forth. Not all of us can do everything. No one of us can do everything. We need each other's help. And it's back and forth. That's the reciprocity or the reciprocal part. You go back and forth helping each other in various ways and in assisting each other. And this reciprocal fraternal assistance, whereby communities strive to give in mutual exchange what each one needs 
in order to grow toward definitive fullness in accordance with God's plan. So God has a plan to give complete fullness to us. And we see this in Ephesians chapter 4, where it says, And his gifts were that some should be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the cunning of men, by their craftiness in deceitful wiles. This is a wonderful passage showing that there's a variety of gifts and no one individual has all of the gifts of teaching, prophecy, being an apostle. All of these different gifts work together. And that's not an exhaustive list of the gifts of God to us, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. St. Paul gives a number of lists of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and they sometimes overlap, but they don't all agree. Why? Because he, you know, wants to argue with himself? No, because he keeps mentioning, probably thinking of new gifts or other gifts that come to his mind as he's writing. There are so many gifts that God pours upon the church, and he is powerful to give us those gifts. This coming Sunday when we read, I believe it will be in, in the Latin rite, we read from uh, Romans 16, where we, we talk about you know, this, that God is powerful to give us the gifts for, the, for proclaiming the, the same gospel that Jesus Christ gave us his message. And we need those gifts. And we look to so many wonderful wonderful preachers of the gospel in different ways. I just, just last night I was over at the, the Maronite Parish here in Birmingham and we're having a novena every night at, at 7 o'clock. And after the novena, some of us were talking about at one of the local churches, they, uh, one of the mega churches, they got a new pastor. So people were coming to meet him for his introductory uh, meeting with the people on a weeknight. And there was this, uh, uh, there's one guy who was trying to get in too, uh, kind of a street person, and he was trying to get in. And a lot of people ignored him. And when he did eventually get into the church, told him to sit in the back. And, you know, he just looked kind of scruffy and all that. But people just were telling him to be quiet, and they were trying to avoid him. And... Then after, after everybody gets a seat, including this guy, they, uh, one of the leaders of the church, one of the deacons of the church was up in the front and said, we'd like to introduce our new pastor. Uh, would you please come up to the pulpit? And it's the street guy. He dressed himself down and he said to them, Jesus our Lord taught us that when I was hungry, naked, a stranger, etc., he took care of me. And y'all didn't do that. And the people wept. They, they started crying in repentance. And he, that was his first sermon. And in effect, you know, now that's, that's when you look to and say, that is a good sermon. He really is a good preacher. And all of us need to learn that kind of preaching uh, and other kinds of preaching. We can learn from one another in the other communities some of the effective ways to communicate, as they can also learn from us. Pope John Paul mentions how we are aware that as the Catholic Church, we have received much from the witness borne by other churches and ecclesial communities to certain common Christian values. Now, this is very important for us to look at. Think of some of the great Christian leaders who are in our own country. You know, uh, Reverend Billy Graham 
was very much a strong moral leader who matured and developed over his many years. And his son Graham continues to do much to help serve the poor. And then we can also point out, I believe it was, I, I, I meant to look this up, but uh, there was a, an explosion. You know, t uh, terrorists went into a Christian church in Pakistan and, blew, and set off a bomb and started shooting the people as they're worshiping on Sunday, getting ready for Christmas. And I believe it was a Protestant church. It, we look to their witness and see that they were willing to die for Christ. They took a risk even going to church and knowing that they're terrorists who blow up mosques. They're Muslims who blow up mosques of Muslims they don't agree with. So, of course, going to a Christian church, whether Catholic or non-Catholic, is a risk. And we look to their good example and their testimony in this continuing age of martyrdom that we saw begin in the 20th century. We also look at the ways in which um, they have studied those Christian values. Many Protestant theologians have examined, you know, these, uh, the modern world. Uh, one of the areas where we can look to great strength right now, many Protestant writers are doing extremely well in trying to understand marriage and family. Uh, people like Dr. James Dobson and others who've done a lot to promote Christian family and family values at a time when the culture is going back to the pre-Christian pagan. They, matter of fact, they, it's so interesting to me. They try to say, well, we don't want these conservative values of family. No, what you are doing is you are giving up the modern values of family that Christianity introduced. You're going back to the far more conservative pagan notions of family as not treating the dignity of the family members. Of, as having equal value in Christ. The Christian church brought that into being. And now they're destroying what Christians have done. And the witness of many Christian theologians, especially, again, that's a strong area where Protestants have written a lot and we need to learn from. As, um, and also how they uh, experience these, because Protestant communities are also experiencing their young people leave the faith and leave the church and not get married and enter into various kinds of sinful relationships that are self-destructive. This is a common reality. Among the achievements of the last 30 years now, for in our times, the last 50 years, because it's more than 20 years since this was written, this reciprocal fraternal influence, this back and forth sharing, has had an important place at the stage which we have now reached. And we see that um, this uh, process of mutual enrichment must be taken seriously into account. I've, I certainly recommend to lots of Catholic parents some of the books by Dr. James Dobson. We can take that very seriously, learning from his wisdom and other people, Gary, uh, another minister, Gary Smalley and others, have done wonderful reflection on family and marriage. We need to take that seriously as well as offering to them some of our wisdom. I have pastors asking me about uh, various elements of how confession works and how to deal with the, 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 the sinful issues that people bring to them. And sometimes we have a lot more reflections on moral theology, especially social moral theology. That's something where they, you know, seek mutual aid from us Catholics. And based on the communion which already exists as a result of ecclesial elements present in the Christian communities, this process will certainly be a force impelling toward full and visible communion, the desired goal of the journey that we are making. We want to see that full communion. And uh, there are, especially right now, I would say that the uh, 
there's some real differences theologically between evangelicals and Catholics uh, and some Pentecostals and Catholics. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, I, I've been talking to a local Baptist uh, minister and he says a lot of that is fading because we need each other as allies in trying to rebuild the Christian notion of family that is under constant attack by this culture. And once again, the role of God in our society and the freedom of Christians and other believers to speak about God in public. This is something that we see a lot of tension with, and we need to work together on this. And it's not a victory for one or the other, but together we need to worry. Just, I just saw that a, someone who's a Satanist, who doesn't even believe in Satan, really, just calls himself a Satanist, but he wants to make sure that we get rid of in God we trust on the money. If he doesn't like in God we trust on the money, give his money to EWTN. We'll take good care of it for him. Here, we have the ecumenical expression of the gospel law of sharing. This leads me to once more state, and this is something where Pope uh, St. John Paul was speaking to the cardinals back in 1985, June of 1985, where he said, we must take every care to meet the legitimate desires and expectations of our Christian brethren coming to know their way of thinking and their sensibilities. The talents of each must be developed for the utility and the advantage of all. That this is going to be a very important part of our relationship, that we understand the mentality of other Christians so that we enter into their mindset and how they think so that not so that we necessarily agree on points of dispute, but so that we understand what the dispute means and then also understand where we are saying the same thing, though sometimes with different vocabulary. Sometimes we really are saying very different things. It, it's, it's, it's not very profound to say, oh, we really all, we're all saying the same. No, sometimes we say the opposite. You know, a, a lot of Protestants say exactly the opposite about the Holy Eucharist. That's why we don't have open communion. Some of them deny that this is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. And recently a Protestant was saying to uh, this uh, a friend of mine that uh, one of my parishioners, uh, St. Elias, that he is afraid of Catholics saying too much is present in the Eucharist. And that's his had a reticence about the Eucharist. He's saying too much about it. And we're, of course, concerned they're not saying enough. So these are very important elements. Now, he moves on, and this is going to be a, an even longer section and this is his concern with the ministry of unity of the Bishop of Rome. In other words, the papacy, which is his role, is there for the unity of the whole church. And that's his, the primary goal of the papacy. Paragraph 88, he begins, Among all the churches and ecclesial communities, the Catholic Church is conscious that she has preserved the ministry of the successor of the Apostle Peter, the Bishop of Rome, whom God established as her, quote, perpetual and visible principle. This is from Lumen Gentium, paragraph 23. So Vatican II says, and I quote, the Roman pontiff as the successor of Peter is the perpetual and visible principle and foundation of unity of both the bishops and of the faithful. Vatican II is very clear on the role of the papacy. And uh, the Holy Spirit sustains the Pope in order that he may enable all others to share in this essential good. Pope St. Gregory the Great, Gregory the First, uh, spoke about the papacy, about himself, 
as being servus servorum dei, which means the servant of the servants of God. This designation is the best possible safeguard against the risk of separating power, and in particular the primacy, from ministry. This is a risk, and it's happened many times in the papacy's history, where some popes so emphasized their power and primacy, now not only their spiritual power, but sometimes their secular power, because for many hundreds of years, the papacy ruled central Italy because there was nobody else. They didn't get it by conquest, but by default, the secular government gave up on Italy when the barbarians took over and the papacy basically ruled central Italy until 1870. So for about 1100 years it was its own country. And too often various popes saw that power, that political power, as separated from their ministry of being the servant of the servants of God. Good examples of that bad behavior would be people like uh, Pope Julius II, who went off to lots of wars against uh, the uh, French and other invaders of Italy and other Italian states. And also Pope Alexander VI, who did some very good things uh, politically to help stop war between Portugal and Spain, but he also did a lot of bad in Italy. That's why Julius II and uh, Alexander VI and even uh, Pope Leo X, they're all mentioned by uh, Machiavelli in his great book, The Prince. Uh, I've just been reading over that again. It's interesting to see his perspective, how he talks about their, um, uh, you know, the, their various uh, uh, foibles and sins of power. One of the worst things was um, he, he mentioned that uh, Caesar never tells you what he's going to do and Pope Alexander never tells you what he's already done. In other words, different kinds of lies by different kinds of politicians. Who, why should a pope be labeled as a model of uh, bad behavior? because he separated power from ministry. Such a separation would contradict the very meaning of power according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ our Lord who in Luke 22 verse 27 and in the parallels in Mark and Matthew, uh, he's the one who said, for which is the greater, one who sits at table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who sits at table, but I am among you as one who serves, says the Lord Jesus Christ, head of the church. That's why Pope St. John Paul acknowledged when he went to the World uh, Council of Churches in June 1984, the Catholic Church's conviction that in the ministry of the Bishop of Rome she has preserved uh, with fidelity to the apostolic tradition and to the scriptures in the faith of the apostle, uh, fathers, the visible sign and guarantor of unity, but it constitutes a difficulty for most other Christians whose memory of the papacy is marked by certain painful recollections. Not only Machiavelli, but many Christians also have very painful uh, memories of papal history. And to the extent that we are responsible for this, I join my predecessor, Blessed Paul VI, in asking forgiveness. This is a good point of repentance by two popes who did not separate ministry from power, but saw power, as the papal power and authority, as being subservient to being servants. And this is something that we very much uh, want to see uh, continue on with Pope Francis and, of course, with Pope uh, Emeritus Benedict and so on. 
This is uh, something that's extremely important, and we can't defend the indefensible about papal past sins. There are plenty of them. But we want to go forward by calling all of us to see that unity of service and papal power. All right, we're going to take a break. I want to get to your questions and comments, so please stay with us. Welcome back. So uh, we're going to take some of your questions. I have an interesting situation here. There's a caller who didn't want to be on the air. I guess I'm getting mean in my old age. Uh, <laughs> callers are scared. But, uh, but Madeline in California asks a great question. Does the Christmas tree mean anything for Catholics? Is it a pagan symbol? <clears throat> no, it's not Madeline. It's not a pagan symbol. As a matter of fact, the Christmas tree represents the defeat of pagan symbolism. Now, the story of the, uh, uh, of the Christmas tree goes back to St. Boniface. St. Boniface was an Englishman who became a, a Benedictine monk and went from England to Germany as an evangelist. And he was made a bishop by the Pope so that he would go into Germany and set up churches uh, among the various pagans. Well, up in the uh, north central Germany, I think it's at the town of Fulda, Fulda, um, uh, there was a large oak. And the uh, Germanic tribes believed that trees were symbols of different deities, of Wotan or Woden, the same guy, or uh, Baldar, one of his sons, uh, had these trees as their favorite. And this one tree especially was the site of pagan worship. And when he was challenged, St. Boniface cut down the tree. And when he took the axe to it, apparently it was rotten or something, but inside, as he destroyed that worshipped tree, inside was an evergreen, a symbol of uh, eternal life. Why? Well, because evergreens don't shed their leaves the way this old oak tree did. I believe it was an oak. That was a sacred oak that he destroyed, and there was this evergreen inside. And so it was a symbol that the destruction of the tree worshipped by these Germanic pagans. Well, as it was destroyed, the Christmas tree was inside, the evergreen as a symbol of eternal life that comes from Christ. So the Christmas tree is a sign of Christ conquering paganism not promoting paganism. And a lot of times uh, that old uh, uh, story gets forgotten or not known. And then in terms of the decorations of the trees, it became a custom a little bit later in the Middle Ages to train trees to give forth their fruit, especially apples and pears, northern parts of Europe. They would train them to bear their fruit a little bit later. So they would ripen inside the houses of, I mean, not the peasants' uh, cottages and shacks, but inside the great castles. And so the idea of having you know, those glass balls on the trees as decorations, that's an imitation of these trees that were trained to have fresh fruit around Christmas time. So, because otherwise all you had was dried fruit. 
and having fresh fruit was an incredible treat. We get all kinds of fresh fruit. I'll never forget, um, uh, this is back uh, in the 80s, before communism had fallen. And um, there was a Polish Jesuit who was working here in the United States. And at our Christmas dinner, we had strawberries. And he said, God bless America, strawberries in December, because in Poland they never had it. It's only in the spring they had them. But we can now have them shipped from South America and Mexico, and we have strawberries all year round. They're not as tasty because they're, you know, picked green, but there's, there's still strawberries. So they, they didn't have that in the old days. And the, the uh, decorations of the Christmas tree are in imitation of that fresh fruit that we grow on there. And then, of course, things like tinsel and all that uh, imitates, you know, if you've ever been in the woods in the um, winter after there's been uh, uh, either an ice storm, uh, hopefully a mild one, uh, or where, where there's, uh, uh, you know, uh, a heavy mist and all the trees get coated with a little bit of ice and then they glisten, that's, that's all, it's just imitating nature inside the house. And the nice thing about uh, tinsel is that even if it's warm in the house, they don't melt <laughs> like the ice does. All right, we have another, we have a caller who's going to stay on here. We have Sam. Sam, where are you calling from? Father, Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas. Sam, great to have you here. Calling from the Republic of Texas. What is I your question? Father. Yes, Father. This past Saturday, I was I visited a Maronite church, and I stayed for the liturgy. All right, and uh, it was centered on St. Joseph. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Holy yeah, Saint. this was in the Maronite liturgy. This past Sunday was the Sunday of the revelation to St. Joseph. All right, and then the priest, uh, the, uh, father, the father mentioned that uh, the Holy St. Joseph had been, uh, was a widower before mm -hmm. receiving Our Lady, mm -hmm. and that threw me off. Uh, at the end, I approached him and asked, gosh, that uh, I was a little bit disturbed by that, but I thought I had heard that many years before. And he says, uh, yeah, he told me that, uh, again, don't believe anything, everything that's in the Bible. All right. Uh, but uh, in, his hom in, in, in his homily, he was saying about how at that time in marrying, uh, well, the men and women would stand uh, uh, and the priest would somehow use some kind of uh, a staff to give one to the male. Yeah, okay. I, Sam, let me, let me interrupt a little bit, because you got a number of little uh, points kind of confused here, and you're trying to put them together, whereas I, I think I can give you the source you can go to for this. There is a book written around 125 A.D., it's called the Proto-Evangelion of James, or the Proto-Gospel, or First Gospel of James. And you can get that online. I don't know if we have it at our website, but if you just put in Proto-Gospel of James, you'll find it. It is a Jewish Christian work that tells about the family life of Christ. It's in that book, chapter 3, for instance, two, chapter 2 and 3, that we read about St. Joachim and St. Anna as the parents of Our Lady. And then later on in that book, we see that when Our Lady was about uh, uh, 12, 13, some, a teenager, young teenager, it was time for her to become betrothed. And a number of men were called together, and one of them was the widower, Joseph. And while they were standing there, he, you know, everybody, everybody carried staffs. They would walk with the staff because if you were walking in the countryside and a wolf or a bear or a wildcat or hyena would come up on you, you need a good stout staff to whack him over the head with so he doesn't eat you. I'm against being eaten uh, by those critters. So everybody carried staves if they walked around uh, on journeys, and uh, as well as to hold on to for resting when they were standing. And 
when they were trying to choose which young man would, or which gentleman would uh, be betrothed to Our Lady, the staff of St. Joseph blossomed into a lily. That's why you see St. Joseph carrying a lily in so many of the statues. It's not in the Bible. It comes from this proto-gospel of James, which was never part of the Bible. It was a later book, again, produced by Jewish Christians. And that's where you get the idea of Joseph being a widower and uh, that he be, became betrothed to Our Lady. So that's where that comes from. Um, and it's not, uh, you see it in a lot of Catholic art. It's affected popular Catholic art. And it is one possibility, but it is not the official teaching of the church. The church does not make doctrine on the basis of that book because it's not the Bible. Does that help, Sam? Uh, I think he's down. Okay. Well, but Sam, I hope that that helps. And again, I urge you to take a look at that. You can read it. Um, uh, but we don't know if that's the, the case. But that is what uh, Jewish Christians in the early part of the second century, so within the lifetime of the apostles and Our Lady and such, um, you know, uh, well, within, within a generation or two after them, uh, they're writing that down as their memories. All right, let's go to another call. We have Rick calling from Michigan. Is that right? Grand Rapids, Michigan. Father. Grand Rapids, sure. My, my kid brother's down in South Haven. Yes, I hear that on EWTN. <laughs> uh, Father, I've got a quick question. I think, I think um, my, uh, uh, some Catholic apologist, I might have misinterpreted on EWTN, Oh. Um, say uh, quickly in a, in a few seconds uh, I could tell you something about Folded too yeah. but um, I have a, a dear friend a retired Christian reform minister mm -hmm. we get together on Thursday go through the lectionary go through the Bible mm -hmm. and he respectfully asked me you know, questions about the Catholic Church what it teaches and mm -hmm. I try my best to answer them and I think I heard some of the Catholic apologists on the EWTM radio say, well, if you plant some seeds of Catholicism and he doesn't explore it and come to the Catholic Church that he's culpable, he's going he's gonna to lose his salvation. And uh, I, don't, I don't think so. He's a very dear Christian, and yeah, yeah. You know, we respect each you know, other. Yeah, yeah. And this is something that I think we have to be somewhat cautious about making that kind of judgment. Now, it is possible that somebody would say, I don't care, and I've actually come across such a situation, that um, some people uh, say, I don't care if the Catholic Church is right, I can't leave because this is a better living. Well. You, you never make a decision because this is such a good living. You have to base it on the truth. But what you're discussing is not that kind of situation. There's no malice. There's no ill will. There is an open, honest reflection together as Christian brothers, in the, the case of you and your friend. And, um, you know, we, we don't... Um, you know, jump to such judgments. We simply continue to move forward in helping that dialogue because we're trying to come to the truth together. And what you're describing is the, exactly what Pope St. John Paul was talking about in terms of an authentic dialogue among Christians who are seeking not to win the argument, but who are seeking the truth of God together and coming to know each other prayerfully and reflectively. I, I can't do anything except commend that very highly. Does that ring true to you? Yes, it does, Father. Now, of course, if I planted the, the seeds of Catholicism and he, he, he wanted to become a Catholic, I wouldn't say, are, are you sure you know what you're doing? 
you yeah. know. No, 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 I, no, no. I'd yeah. encourage it. Exactly, exactly. And see, right. I, I actually knew another situation where uh, a, a Protestant minister said to a priest, I believe after these discussions we've had that I, the Catholic Church is true and I want to join. And it was the fault of the priest who said, no, 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 you'll do better staying where you are. Yeah. And, and I, 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 that was encouraging the man to go against his conscience. His conscience had moved to becoming Catholic. Mm -hmm. And the, it was the fault of the priest to not help the man to further the development of his conscience. And I was able later on to actually confront, because I came across this episode long after it had happened, but I, I confronted the priest and he admitted uh, you know, later on, yeah, no, you're right. I, I was incorrect. I was being falsely ecumenical. His conscience was Catholic. And so yeah. I want to encourage him to, to follow that development. Okay, well, great. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to go to an email here from Arthur in Largo, Florida. Dear Father Mitch, Considering the current state of affairs, I'm wondering why God has not let his wrath come forth as he did in ages past. It would seem that we lost our fear of God. I was reading the book of Ezekiel, which documents God inflicting punishment on Israel for idolatry and other sins. Some very scary stuff to be sure, which begs the question, why doesn't God do this again? Can it be that our society is not as depraved as Israel was, or did I miss something? Arthur. Well, Arthur, um, uh, how much of God's punishment are you looking to see? Um, you know, I, for one thing, I would say we've had a pretty rough year. You know, when you think about the severity of the hurricanes that hit Texas, Florida, the uh, Virgin Islands, and, and Puerto Rico, um, pretty severe to me. And then you add to that these, the worst fires in, you know, I think the third or fourth worst fire in California's history, in known history. Um, you know, this is, uh, now, I, do, do people see this as, God's punishment and such. Do they see this as a call to repent? Um, I would hope they do in this sense. It is very, at the very least, a call for all of us to say, look, I'm not here just to build up my fortunes and the goods for my life. I also must be generous to people who have lost everything. They've lost their homes, all their possessions. I know folks in that kind of situation in Texas. And now we, we well, plenty of folks in California, I mean, everything they have, they're, they're sifting through the dust of their burnt homes to find a few mementos. Uh, and this is a call for us not only to see that, you know, the, the, well, the world is a dangerous place. Earth is dangerous. There's no way around that. So there are a lot of risks being here. Um, and that's, that's the way life is. But at the same time, we can see this as God calling us to turn away from our self-centeredness towards care of our brothers and sisters. And this is a call to a certain kind of repentance. Now, will our culture see this as God's wrath? They don't see God's goodness or his wrath. They don't want to see God. You know, and this is something where we have to, you know, be willing to call folks out to do so and to see that he's calling us to a real generosity to help Puerto Rico, which still doesn't have all of its electricity, and Virgin Islands, they're not going to have their electricity back for a month, and other places that are really poor and hurting. 
So this is something that uh, we can all look to as how can I repent and come to a deeper sense of care and do some evangelization. Lots of churches have jumped in. We can all use these opportunities right now. And I don't know what else you want to see happen, but I'm not looking forward to anything worse. All right, let us go to an email from Brenda in wonderful Lake Charles, Louisiana. I like going there. Uh, wonderful bishop over there, too. Dear Father Mitch, why is it that so many times when purgatory is mentioned in conversation, there is associated with it an aspect of time or duration as in the length of a person's stay in purgatory? Uh, Pope St. John Paul II said that it was not to be thought of in terms of time. So why does this prevalent misconception continue? Brenda. Well, Brenda, the, the, like any other misconception that people have, it continues based on our general ignorance. <laughs> All of us have a certain amount of forgetfulness, a certain amount of ignorance. What you see is in some of the older books, that there were indulgences that were timed very precisely, 300 days indulgence, a year indulgence, etc. But that was not time off of purgatory. That was time that you were off in um, uh, of punishment given to you for your confession. The penances used to be very serious. Sometimes your penance would be uh, I know for uh, murder, it used to be 21 years on bread and water. So a year indulgence was a year off of that penance. That's, that's what they were talking about. And people confuse that with time and purgatory. So I go with Pope St. John Paul. There is not a counting of days and years and purgatory, but on earth. But our indulgences do pray, and we don't worry about the, the application of time, God takes care of that. Let's take another email from Bill in Franklin, Tennessee. One of my favorite restaurants is up there. Uh, Loveless Motel and Cafe, best biscuits I've ever ate in my life. Dear Father Mitch, does the seal of confessional extend to a priest's prior knowledge of an event? For instance, if he witnesses a murder, and the murderer then comes to him and confesses the sin. Is the priest prevented from testifying later in court? Bill in Franklin, Tennessee. I don't think he is. If the priest bases what he saw, bases what he says in court only on the information that he saw happen in front of him, he can say it because he has that outside the sealed confession. Nothing mentioned in confession. Perhaps the person's motives or anything like that. None of that can be mentioned. But, um, the, but he can uh, mention what he saw outside of confessional. And then also, Father Mitch, our parish priest, regularly skips the Gloria and or Creed at the Sunday Mass. These are required parts of Mass. How can he do this? Does it make the Mass invalid? Cindy in Seattle. Cindy, no, it does not make the Mass invalid because the glory and the creed are not necessary for it to be a valid Mass. But it is not licit. So what he's doing is illicit. It's a sin on his part to knowingly skip that. No, maybe he doesn't realize. Uh, of course, in Advent, you don't, we don't say the glory. I will do that again after Christmas. But the creed is always said. And there, there was an ideological reason um, that some feminists uh, were against saying the creed and the gloria. That is not legitimate. That is illicit. And it is sinful to skip those on purpose. But that does not invalidate the Mass. Christ is still present, it's still a valid Mass. But it's, again, it's essential to remember that it's not the priest's Mass. It is Jesus Christ's Mass and the Church's Mass. We go along with what the liturgy says. And i got to go along with what the producer says. We're out of time. So, may the Lord bless you and give you a wonderful Christmas and New Year's celebration. The Father, 
the Son and the Holy Spirit. May God's peace be with all of your families as you get together and enjoy each other's company and pray for those who are not with you at this time. And also, we again, we ask you to please be generous to us at this Christmas season. We continue to need your help and support in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. And that way we'll pay our bills too. Thank you and God bless. Thank you.